I'm really delighted to be here this afternoon to celebrate the, uh, the 20th anniversary, something that started out as a crazy little plan. And it wasn't my plan. I, I was just the front man. So I want to spell out some lessons that I've learned that may be of use to you. Reminisce a little about the origins of KMI. Say a little bit about the secret ingredients uh, that made it work. I hopefully tell you a few things that you didn't know. Here's an example, something uh, I don't think anybody knew. I'll bet you didn't know that KMI's first director was actually Tom Vincent. So I'm going to bring up Tom uh, in about five minutes' time. Uh, Tom not only taught me everything I know about interacting with authority and how to manage a group, but he allowed me to be the front man while silently making or influencing all major decisions in the background with nothing more than a glance, raised eyebrow, or an all-powerful veto that he only exercised twice. He'd say to me, hey, Mark, that's an interesting idea, and I respect uh, your decision, but um, if you go ahead with that, my team and I are leaving. <laughs> His decisions were invariably correct, and I never, ever went against them. So he was the de facto leader of the entire lab. But that's only the veto side. Let's look at the positive side, uh, more importantly. His brilliant work with multimedia enabling technologies. And enabling means learners with disabilities, providing, providing a hand to them, for which he had been awarded an MBE, which was a cornerstone of KMI from the very beginning. And let's consider his creativity in the design of KMI itself. <clears throat> his gutsiness in obtaining the first building we inhabited, and against all the odds, overturning the architect's misguided plans for our second dwelling, the top floor of this very building, in fact. <coughs> now, the first building was a nifty double-sized terrapin hut, uh, many of you will remember. Tom launched the idea upon me as follows. I was in his office one day, and he said, he said to me, hey, Mark, let's go look at some buildings. Uh, Terrapin headquarters is only just down the road uh, in Bletchley. So I said, gee, uh, how are we going to do that? And he said, simple. Uh, let's just go. So uh, when, I said, kind of stalling for time, and he said, now. <laughs> the rest is history. We did it that afternoon. Tom's audacity was a key ingredient in KMI. But he also brought a passion about his work mixed with a social conscience, okay? We have audacity, passion, and social conscience, a remarkable combination. Now, I only had the problem of kicking things off from 1995 to 2000. Sustaining and growing KMI for the next 15 years was a lot tougher. We've seen some great leaders in Enrico Mata, Peter Scott, John Demang, oh, thank you, John Demang, uh, collectively, well, soon to be John Demang, collectively propelling KMI onto the world stage as research leaders in their own right. And incidentally, all great hackers, I'll come, on, come back to that in a minute, great leaders, great hackers, a rare combination, okay? But I'm only going to talk about the lessons learned from those first few years of KMI. So I need to say up front, these guys made my working life a breeze and enabled me to retire early uh, with confidence in the future of KMI. So the lesson here is clear. Surround yourself with a great team. Watch the sparks fly. Okay. Now, speaking of a great team, Kitty Chisholm, now Lady Chisholm, made four amazing contributions to those early years of KMI that you probably don't know about. One, she introduced me and Tom when we were independently touting around some loosely related ideas. Two, when I was dithering about whether we had the wherewithal to mount such a major, a major initiative, <clears throat> Kitty basically said, oh, for heaven's sake, stop dithering and just do it. <laughs> Three, she co-wrote, ghost wrote, or totally wrote the key vision papers, finance papers, and major university documents that enabled us to get approval from the University Senate. Four, she raised lots of money. <laughs> Okay, so the lesson here for all of you is find and partner with the key catalysts to make things happen. We were incredibly lucky to find Kitty. Now, Kitty had her own key team member working behind the scenes to make KMI's early plans add up. 
Yez Gjondov. Young, dynamic, lateral thinking, fearless. He was to become the spirit of KMI. Now, here's one of his hobbies, sailing outrageously tall ships. <laughs> okay, now here is a picture of Yez being hoisted aloft to rig the sails in his wheelchair. Just listen to two things he wrote about this adventure. I refuse to put my life on hold while I wait for somebody else to make me whole. There is no reason to deny yourself a romantic, swashbuckling adventure on the high seas. You just need to find the right ship. Lesson, your limitations are only in your head. So thank you, Yez. <clears throat> now, having cooked up a bold plan with Tom and Kitty with some backroom number crunching by Yez, I drew the short straw uh, for, for sounding out Vice Chancellor Sir John Daniel. <laughs> I presented the idea, having practiced <clears throat> for many weeks, but wearing a tie, and this is literally, yes, yeah, so I practiced wearing a tie and saying a million pounds uh, with a straight face. Okay? <laughs> it's, it's honest to God truth, okay? He said to me, not bad, not bad, but nowhere near ambitious enough. <clears throat> However, it could be the missing piece of a jigsaw I've been putting together a 10 million pound plan for revitalizing the open university's usage of new technology. I knew nothing about it at that point until, until that moment. Wow, fantastic. So we were off and running, okay? And what's the lesson in this case? Well, it's that you can and should find that big champion within your organization. Often, the higher up you go, the more creative and willing to listen that person will be. And there were other key people, of course, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Strategy, Jeff Peters, who helped us pave the way for good relations with every faculty across the university, and many more who made up the mix. Now, let me just have a sip here. <clears throat> One of our most important messages is that actions speak louder than words. It's about what you do, not what you say. Now, one of the key things you may not know about KMI, when we were setting it up 20 years ago, every single member of staff was a doer who had either directly or indirectly built major software tools, learning tools, research tools, experimental tools, all with a tangible outcome. So we had an unwritten sign on the door that said non-hackers need not apply. But it was more than unwritten. We, in fact, wrote as much, a little more politely, but in our first advertisements. Okay. So KMI began with the premise that actions speak louder than words, and that premise is part of the lifeblood of KMI. Now, another secret you may not know is the underlying business model, which requires only six words. Great resources, great people, stir, repeat. The lesson here is to build via simple bootstrapping. It only requires the ability to get one or the other resources or people by hook or by crook, not as hard as you think, okay? You may have to make up the resources, but they can be attained, uh, obtained. After which you're self-propelled because great people will do great work. They're self-motivated to continue to generate the output needed to continue attracting great resources and more great people. Now, I'd like to bring up Tom Vincent at this point on stage here to help me demonstrate how that mix, how that mix took place. Yeah, I'm gonna do a little cooking here. Let's, uh, uh, this will be all right. How is this here? Hi, Tom. <laughs> Hi, Tech <Ted. laughs> Here's our little, uh, here, little cooking we're gonna do. Now, yeah, we got a couple of, uh, couple of ingredients. We talked about resources and people. Uh, resources. Here we go, resources. I have, um, we'll put some models in, but some real things. I have real money here. We have dollars, pounds, and euros, okay? Resources go into the mix. We have a little bit of, uh, a little bit of infrastructure, some building work. <laughs> Need infrastructure, building work. We have uh, computational resources. This is a real computer, 
Raspberry Pi into the mix. And of course, as Mark said, we've got people and we've been digging models of people out. We've got one in here that's a grandfather. I think that's me, I think. <laughs> um, but we'll put, the, we'll put the people in as well into this mix because, as Mark said, so important. There they go. All right, let's stir here a little. All right. I'll, uh, I'll just set this aside here to brew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that's the crucial bit to get it to brew a bit. Anyway, many thanks, Mark, uh, for inviting, inviting me to share this session with you on the stage. Uh, it's been such a great privilege to work with him, and I could uh, talk for a long time about that privilege. But uh, you've seen for yourselves what a great person he is anyway. I didn't push him that hard, really. Um, unfortunately, it was only for five years that we worked together because compulsory retirement cut me off and off I went to the uh, green fields and hills of Snowdonia. Uh, but it was a tremendous five years that I was there, and not least because of all the people that were working with me and supporting. It's, there were some very talented people, and resources came along as a result of uh, that talent. And we then did more projects that, again, produced more results. The Terrapin Hut provided uh, a point to demonstrate our potential uh, for the future, became a working showcase, and convinced people to invest in KMI. We had many meetings, but during one of them over lunch, I think we're out in Milton Keynes having lunch, and I looked to Kitty and Mark and said, gosh, Kitty, Mark, I... KMI. We've done it. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, why the hell didn't I do it KMT? <laughs> no, that wouldn't have worked anyway. Um, but one of the ideas that came out of our magic pot that's been around for a long time was to raise a flag, as you've seen it there on the flagpole. Well, I could tell you the history of that, but one thing you probably don't know, you need planning permission to put a flagpole <laughs> up. And did we get into trouble for that? Uh, subsequently, we moved, we moved into the Barrel Building. Uh, it was a great step forward. However, we still had plans in mind, a purpose-built purpose -built building. Kitty and I put together a proposal that went to a trust that uh, supported uh, projects with people with disabilities. And we'd hoped the, this trust would put up some money so we could extend part of KMI already. Uh, that we only just moved in, we want to extend it. Um, we, did, and we came very close on that one. We didn't actually get it on this occasion. Um, but later, after that, we put in another a KMI proposal for a national centre for new media. And that brought us in contact with a large number of national par partners who joined with us uh, to put this proposal together. And it went to the Millennium Commission, and it didn't actually attract the 22 million that we asked for. We tried. Uh, but it actually, the outcomes were very good because that working with partners, national partners on a bid like that, brought us into closer contact with them and some of them in turn funded us and some of us carried on uh, collaborating uh, with us. We did get some money out of the Millennium Commission and they funded uh, one programme which was the, the uh, a million pound programme, the Clutch Project, Computer Literacy Understanding Through Community History. A great little project, uh, 300 parents in local schools who had got lost in what, they would, what their children were doing with technology, and we thought we'd give them a help. But the starting point was they had to go out and study some community history and get it together and set it out before they get it, got close to a computer at all. So it wasn't a traditional computer course, which was sit down and do word processing. They got their history and they wanted to show it to the world. So the motivation was great. I think we've got nearly 100% 
as those teachers came through that nine months with us. Um, I mean, the one message I'd like to pass on at this point was just that if anything comes along, keep that ambition in mind. A purpose-built built building would be tremendous. I mean, you never know what's around the corner on funding. If the, what I've put here is be prepared. Something might come along. The one other ingredient I'd like to add to the mix is that the application of new media for uh, individual and special needs, this is clearly close to my heart and was focus of my research for many years. When I looked on the website last week, I noticed that there were now uh, this year 18,000 students declaring a disability. And the potential to meet their needs, of course, is very high. I mean, a few years ago, when I was uh, being presented with problems about certain students having difficulties on courses, I came across, of course, quite obviously, students with a visual impairment who couldn't read course units. And so there was a great scheme going, which was the recording of the course units onto audio cassette. Very successful. But you imagine yourselves with a pile of 100 cassettes for one set of course units trying to study with that in an interactive way. Very difficult. But along came compact disc technology, and we set up what was the dream project for digital recording audio educational material. And that has moved, moved things along very well, and I gather uh, is still well in place. Um, another example was the work, the outstanding multimedia project that the late Dr. Peter Wally uh, was involved in. He was so well known for the virtual microscope in a development in the very early days of multimedia. And this became an alternative for students with a disability who couldn't use a microscope. And things built on, on that. And there were developments like remote access to um, uh, science um, courses when they went out on into the hills to look at rocks and looking at remote access to the working and getting involved, sorry, interactively uh, through a real-time link to those. There were projects like that. They're all building on the sort of ideas that came out of Peter's work, uh, particularly his work in local schools. Um, I remember when David Putnam came up here once, we took him to the, one of the schools that uh, Peter was working, the main one, and the kids there, 11, 12-year-olds, carefully explained to Lord Putnam, this is how you make film. You get a camera, a digital <laughs> camera, and a computer, and you've got it. He was very impressed with those. Uh, but the work we did didn't just, it wasn't just for students, many of our projects. We had blind composers working with us uh, who were able to use a computer with speech output to produce their own music scores and print them out and give them a degree of independence that they hadn't had before. And the same with blind physiotherapists who were able to use a similar computer system for keeping patients' records. So these projects in themselves illustrate the role that new, new technology can play in meeting special needs. All I hope is that there's a place for this aspect in the future of KMI. Just keep it in the back of the mind if there's an opportunity to uh, apply it also with a slight adaptation to the needs of the large group of people who need a particular attention, then that'll be good. So, oh, I think the pot's simmered. <laughs> Mom told me to give it a stir. Oh, well. It doesn't like being stirred in. <laughs> so, my good friend Mark, if he could arrive, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Very nice. Thank you very much.
Now, I just want to finish up uh, bringing back the themes of um, audacity and passion. <clears throat> One of the biggest influences in my life on me was US President John F. Kennedy. By 1962, he had announced the manned mission to the moon program. In September of that year, at Rice University in Texas, in a sun-drenched football stadium on an impossibly hot afternoon, he made a speech, OK? And I'd like to play a one-minute clip for you right now. For we do not now know what benefits await us. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. OK, the applause drown out. His final uh, four words are, uh, we must be bold, OK? Now, <laughs> of all his famous sound bites, there's one in the clip you just heard that does not get much, much press attention. But it's the one that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and has influenced me to this day. Okay? He says, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented. Wow. The whole package he was offering was already impossible. And to top it off, it all depended on a commitment to technologies that had not yet been invented. Now, that's audacity. That's passion. I loved it. Okay? I, was a, I was a teenager. Okay? Silicon Valley has its roots in the attitudes and funding that flowed from this speech, and so does KMI. Okay? But audacity and passion are tough to sustain. Your act quickly becomes old news without the next and final ingredient. Okay? This ingredient is about being a newcomer. A number of things have become clear to me since I retired eight years ago, particularly connected with some hobbies I've been pursuing in sailing, music, and running a startup business. The key lesson is that in many walks of life, other people truly don't give a damn about your background, track record, CV, or much else. It's really all about how you are performing right now. Can you tie that knot in a stormy sea safely and quickly? Can you play that tune in front of a tough audience? Can your business handle tough competitors and fussy customers? Your background doesn't matter. And it's very sobering and refreshing to discover this. Now, <clears throat> uh, incidentally, <laughs> I don't do very well in any of these environments. <laughs> I've dented my boat, I've flubbed my solos and my harmonies, and I've lost money in business. But once in a while, things gel. You hit the right note, uh, both literally and metaphorically, and that makes it all worthwhile. So I'm always the new kid on the block, the newbie, and that keeps me fresh. So my final piece of advice, be a newbie in certain activities. Don't pretend to know it all. <laughs>